Hi everyone and welcome back to the FantasyFootballFix.com YouTube channel for another Elite 11 team reveal. We've got Corey Baker back on the channel this week and he is on his wild card ahead of game week 10. Now you should be able to head over to FantasyFootballFix.com if you do want to follow Corey's thoughts and the other elite managers over on FantasyFootballFix.com with push notifications enabled. So I do encourage you to do that. But in this week's video, we're looking ahead to game week 10 with Corey on his wild card. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Guys, welcome back to the channel and we are recording on Sunday night. The West Ham Aston Villa game has just got through. So you'll apologize I do apologize if I am not my usual happy self. Um you you will have to forgive me for that. But we've got Corey on and Corey is on his wild card, so I'm sure he's gonna up my spirits. Corey, welcome back to the channel, man. How's it all going? Uh it's it's going pretty well. Um I'm also not happy <laughs> being a non Watkins and non Bowen owner, so uh I share your pain. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand. And, and you know, that game, it always felt like it was going to be a big swingy game for a lot of FPL managers. And if you were happen to be in the camp that we both are in and not owning those folks, then it's so proved. So congratulations to those who did own them, of course, and commiserations to those who, who didn't. We can see on screen at the moment, Corey, that you've been sort of around sort of that, that, that level overall rank for a few game weeks do you want to just bring the guys up to speed on how your season's been going and how it's come to be that you've actually pressed the wild card ahead of game week 10 rather than a few game weeks ago when you know a lot of managers decided to deploy the chip then yeah sure i um i started out okay actually uh, pretty solid mm -hmm. and then a series of calamitous decisions uh, put me in pretty bad position um, in in right around game week five, game week six. Uh, I I was I was around, I don't know, 400,000 or so after game week three or four, somewhere mm -hmm. around there. Fine, eh? Um, mm -hmm. But then, uh, then that all came crashing down. So um, a lot of people were pulling a wild card. Uh, I decided not to, and there were, there were a couple reasons. Um, firstly, I wanted Sun and Madison for their run, and because my team value is awful, I couldn't really afford Sun with the other players I wanted uh, on wildcard. Mm -hmm. So um, I decided to. That was one of the. That was one of the pressures. The second was that at the time I also wanted Trippier uh, through his run, and I didn't think I'd have him on my wildcard. But we'll see that that has changed. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third being that the players that weren't performing had such great fixtures that it was very, very difficult to drop them. Yeah. And um, it's turned out that I've been punished pretty, pretty, pretty badly for that pause, mainly because Sala and Watkins just have, have like score every week right now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they've also gained a what? 0.6 or so in, in, in value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, so my team value is now really in, in dire straits. Mm -hmm. So um, it didn't work out. It could have changed. You know, the thing about it is it could have went, went differently, right? Mm -hmm. If, if, if someone gets hurt, if, if, <laughs> if Watkins get hurt, if they stop, they stop scoring, um, you know, if other players get hurt, you know, things can change. So I, I don't feel badly about my decision. It just hasn't turned out great, yeah. but I have been able to tread water, um, as you see the last couple of weeks, yeah. um, this is before today. So I'll go back down, but then I have three players on Monday. So mm -hmm. have been able to tread water at least while other people who have pulled their wild cards. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in a position to hopefully take advantage of new information and, and put myself in, in, in a good place. Definitely, man. And it, yeah, it's refreshing to hear you reflect on, on, on how things, you know, could have been different. And that's part of the challenge of the game, isn't it? You can set these decisions up with, with all the information in the world, but there is still a, a question of luck and, and how things go and if it doesn't go in your favor this these these can happen but you've 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 reflected there that you have managed to as you put it tread water today certainly not not out of things and uh as we'll see in a moment we've got several players still to play um in the monday night fixture so we're recording on sunday evening as well so this still could be a big upswing ahead of that game week 10 uh wild card just before we check out your points for game week nine Corey, i've got to ask you historically wild card chip usage for the first wild card of the season would you normally be looking to have used it earlier on or would you be looking to retain it through to the later stat stages of the winter what's your kind of strategy around wild card being over the years yeah it, every every year is different because the schedule is different mm -hmm. um ideally i wait as long as possible i really do not like pulling it away unless i absolutely have to sure. um 
and it, with this this year, as soon as the schedule came out, uh, wild card in nine or ten looked to be uh, what I was shooting for. Yep. Um, given given the, the the fixture changes with Man U, who I started with um, Chelsea, who was you know at when we looked at the beginning of the year, lots of Chelsea players mm-hmm. were 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 in contention. Um, and and uh and, and a couple other teams so i was always looking at around this time frame and then uh i think it did play out to where it made sense for me yeah it's interesting as well Corey. the the value that you mentioned the team value probably not being what you would would have hoped or what it would be in previous seasons as well but speaking to the other elite managers and to yourself uh, over the course of the early stages of the season pretty much everyone's reflected on the fact that there are great budget enablers in the game this season. So hopefully that's something that will mean that you'll still be able to work around the edges and and still get to the squad largely that you'd want, right? There are still some gems out there. Absolutely. Um, I think the, uh, the, the cheaper midfielders who, who've came, who've, uh, you know, came about now with Gordon, uh, Pedro Neto, and then, Palmer, who looks to be on penalties mm. and playing a very creative role for Chelsea, mm. um, they really enable you to to do a lot more, even with a low team value. So I'm not uh, the team value has been a bit annoying, uh, but it's I don't think it's really a, 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 that much of a challenge uh, for, for my wild card. I don't know if I had if you gave me another million dollars, I don't know that my team would look that much different no and i'm intrigued to find out what formation you're intending to be rocking as a part of your wildcard strategy but we'll come on to that Corey, later on in the video and i should say guys as well there are timestamps on the video as well if you do want to uh, hop around across the various different sections but the next section that we're going to do is to look at game week nine and see how Corey's team's performed so far Okay, guys, so we can see straight away that there are a few players here who've yet to play. And goodness me, that could be a massive swing for you, Corey, right? Tomorrow tomorrow evening, the game between uh, Tottenham and Fulham taking place. You've got the fabled double up in midfield between Son and Madison and Udogi in the, in the bat line there as well. I'm really intrigued with the the uh, Newcastle back three, um, though. I love when managers take these type of approaches to uh, managing their FPL teams Corey, how did this come about? Was this part of a longer term vision or did you just sort of organically arrive at this? And how's it actually worked out for you owning the likes of Botman Shah and, and Trippier, who seems like a must have right now? Yeah, I, I was I was always uh, shooting for the double Newcastle de- defense um, mm-hmm. and then Botman got hurt. So heading into to dead ending this game week, um, I needed my other defenders are uh, call were Colwell in Estupanon, yeah. who obviously is hurt. So I didn't want to play Colwell versus Arsenal. So I was certainly going to pick up another Newcastle defender. I went with Shar just yeah. for the fun of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd never owned him. There's not really much difference between him and Byrne. Uh, Shar has, historically is a better attacking threat, but it hasn't yeah. been this year. So I got an extra bonus. So that worked out. And then Botman obviously is still hurt. So uh, Morris. And his lovely two pointer was uh, auto subbed off from the bench, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, no, I mean with our fixtures, and especially um, with the injuries Palace had, I was 100 percent going to get another Newcastle defender yeah. for this week. There was yeah. no question about that. Makes good sense, and and strategically, Corey, do you think the the, the kind of doubling up, and in this case even trebling up, Eddie Howe's helpfulness, notwithstanding in the press conferences, I should hasten to add, but <laughs> yeah. that that type of uh, strategy of doubling up defensively is that something that you know historically and ongoing you kind of advocate for as a strategy for other FPL managers to to deploy? You comfortable doing that with the defense? I mean, I think when you have elite defenses, absolutely, mm-hmm. and um, I, Newcastle is the best or at least one of the two or three best defenses in the league. Uh, and they're besides Trippier, their assets are, are cheap, yeah. right? I mean, Botman and Burn um, aren't being rotated mm-hmm. and they're at four, seven and both started at four five. So, um, you know, in the past, it doubled up on like Arsenal defense, doubled up on Chelsea back in, back in the day when Mourinho and, and city defenses throughout the year and Liverpool, obviously when, uh, they were running rampant, so I don't. I don't have no problem no doubling up on yeah. best defenses. No, like at it. All. Well, now doubling up on the mediocre defenses, I 
I get a little little nervous. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And and you, you're right to call out how um, how effective they've been the Newcastle defence for for quite some time now as well. Looking into that midfield, intrigued to see Brian and Bumo in there. Obviously, had a great return um, in game week nine as well. Has he been a season keeper so far? Has he been in since game week one for you, Corey? Or has he been a chop and change? Yeah, absolutely. Player? No, he's absolutely that. Brentford has such great fixtures, mm-hmm. and um, he he being on penalties, which you know has been a, a huge help for him, yeah. um, and and all left footed set pieces. Like he's he's a great asset. Mm-hmm. Um, I will have I actually already dropped him on the wild card just because of their upcoming fixtures, but I'm sure he'll be back on my team yeah. um, once those fixtures swing again. He's he's been great. Brentford went through a little bit of a hiccup, but I was pretty confident um, they were going to bounce back from Burn- uh, against Burnley, and, and, and they did. Oh, they did, yeah, pretty emphatically, didn't they? Yeah. Okay, cool. I mean, it's it's intriguing, isn't it? You're talking about these players who are on penalties and on the wild card, Corey. I do want to get your thoughts around. Douglas Louise is another make weight midfielder who I was watching the game and hearing these statistics of six home games in a row scoring. He's on penalties. Yes, he plays a bit deeper, but actually the points total from last season as well was su- surprisingly high for him. So intrigued to talk about Aston Villa in a moment. Just final thoughts around your game week nine team as well, then, Corey, as well. Was there any temptation to look elsewhere with the captaincy? How have you felt captaining Haaland over the beginning of part of the season? Are, are you still? Hundred percent, keeping the faith with him. Yeah, I mean, if I had Salah, that would have been a conversation to have. Mm-hmm. But I, mm-hmm. um, no, the, I, I, I have no qualms about Captain Holland. He still yeah. has by far the best underlying goal threat. Um, he hasn't uh, returned and hasn't converted the way he did last year, or no. maybe historically. But in in City in general, aren't aren't nearly what they were. No. Um, Last year, they weren't even what they had been. If you look at the underlying data, it's just that Holland kind of uh, covered all that up by scoring a ridiculous amount of goals. So, mm-hmm. um, but nevertheless, he's still, I mean, he's, he's still a force of nature. Yeah. So yeah, I had no, no concerns. Um, he didn't really get involved all that much, but he did have a, you know, he had a banger this week. So um, what do you attribute yeah. that, that, that lack of, threat i guess which sounds perverse saying that about man city but about that team Corey, you're saying it's over a long period from your observations what do you attribute that to is it a stylistic thing is it the players that they've let go what do you what do you think it is well it's interesting he um the the box formation he's he's implemented two years um i think it's fundamentally changed the 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 creative profile on that team um but De Bruyne and Mares really, when when he would play, he didn't play all, you know, uh, he only played maybe half the time. But those two mm-hmm. really kind of, I think, papered over some of the cracks because they've just created mm-hmm. forces. And now you've got Alvarez, who's fantastic, but he's he's not he's not a creative force. He's he's an all rounder. Mm-hmm. He's I think Alvarez kind of is like a more forward playing Gundogan almost uh, in, in his mm-hmm. obviously not his not his skills, not his repertoire. Uh, in the position he plays, but as far as the underlying output, he kind of fits that role. Um, but what they're missing is is De Bruyne, mm-hmm. and given his age and his health, he may never be there again. So yeah. um, I suspect Pep's going to have to evaluate, reevaluate how they are creating chances, um, and figure out how to to get more attacking threat on this team because they they're like fourth i think in some of the underlying data metrics mm-hmm. it's they're in it, it, it's you know two th- from for the last what how long has he been there 2017 right so the last seven years or so is the last six years they've always been the first yeah like there have been teams that have been close but when it came to come uh, came to attacking threat they were always number one and it really wasn't that that close and that has that has fundamentally changed the last two years and especially this year well, let's see how that plays out in your wildcard thoughts as well, because I know historically we've seen people traveling up on the Man City team and typically with, with three offensive players. So bearing in mind what you've just observed, I'm intrigued to see how that's going to play out with your wildcard team. So let's take a look at Corey's Game Week 10 wildcard thoughts ahead of next game week. Oh, 
okay so look at this a lovely shiny new team goodness me i'm envious looking on with green eyes here Corey. in terms of you well, being able to... look pretty good, don't they? they look stunning <laughs> they look stunning absolutely so i mean obviously guys we should say again recording sunday evening so we've got another game to get through on monday night we've got european fixtures of course so lots of things could change and of course Corey reserves the right to change this and you can follow the thoughts over on fantasyfootballfix.com and the push notifications I mentioned at the beginning of the video. But let's talk through this team, Corey. So if we take through take the defensive uh, players that you've gone through first, you, I believe, kept the, the goalkeepers the same, Ariola and Turner, right? That's probably the cheapest way into a um, a goalkeeper playing pair, right? And is it is that about as straightforward as as, as the thought process is there? And and how, and how do you see it? Is yeah. it a rotation or is it Ariola is the person to trust? What's your thoughts around the goalkeepers here? I mean, I'll still probably rotate, um, mm -hmm. but I, you know, there's a balance there. I think if I had a higher team value, I would probably go Ariola and either Flecken and Johnston. Mm -hmm. um, Turner hasn't been great. Forrest's defense is adequate, but they he has not been great and he could lose his position any time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think... I think if I had a little more money, um, I could go that route. And I still actually might go that route. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really on the fence between Bowen and Diaby mm -hmm. uh, for that, that that fourth midfield spot. If I would go okay. a little cheaper, I yeah. could actually maybe swap Johnston in and then yeah. maybe change uh, Margahi to maybe a Villa defender. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for from a money perspective, I mean, you can't really – and I've had Turner since the get-go, right? So he's four. So that's 8.2 for two – currently starting goalkeeper you really can't beat that no you can't you're absolutely right and and looking at West Ham's fixtures and, and knowing them pretty well as, as you'd expect me to they are pretty sweet now for a prolonged period yeah. now so you'd expect I didn't actually think West Ham were were roundly beaten today but I don't actually think defensively we've looked too bad actually over the beginning part of the season Nariola can get save points as well even when they they do so I like yeah. him as a long-term option anyway um, and look, if you're looking for money to be made up in that midfield, then we can again talk Douglas Louise, man. So uh, we can we can come round to, to yeah. that in the midfield chat. But before we get to that, this this def defensive three. So you're looking at a three five two then. Great. Simicast, bit of a gift for wild cards, would you say, on game week 10? Kind of like a, a no-brainer inclusion, bearing in mind the prognosis for Andy Robertson? Uh, for me, I think so. Um, yeah. There's chances he gets rotated, but... Their, their fixtures are fantastic, mm -hmm. and he's on set pieces on a good set piece threat team. I yeah. don't don't really know why you wouldn't go that route. No. Um, yeah, fair enough. We'll see. I mean, long term, long term, I can't imagine. Uh, you know, I have him for more than a few weeks, but I I don't see why you would you yeah. wouldn't go lovely that. price isn't he and they've got good fixtures as we've as we as we know as well this is always a time to start considering <laughs> liverpool anyway irrespective of the andy robertson news trippio kind of talked about i mean i think it was you who observed on the slack channel that he's now third overall for points is that correct or certainly was prior to the uh to get yeah. nine starting uh, you know or, or, yeah, or to the game nine completing yeah so i mean he's expensive but it looks like it's it's something which we need to all be thinking about right yeah, so I mean, the thing about Trippier is, is um, I was concerned with the Champions League and him being 33 now that mm -hmm. there would be rotation, but that does not seem to be the case. Um, it seems that uh, Howe is going to pull him out early in games that they have control, like this week. Um, and because of that, you have a guy who's leading the league in chances created. Mm -hmm. He as the best underlying bonus, the best underlying BPS of, mm -hmm. I think, any player. Mm -hmm. And so, and and he's on the best defense. So if he gets a clean sheet or gets any kind of attacking re, uh, return, he's probably going to be in the bonus. We saw that when he had the assist at uh, West Ham. Mm -hmm. He still ended up with a six-pointer, mm -hmm. even though they gave up two goals because he had a single assist and ended up with two bonus points. Yeah. So um, he is expensive, but... The thought process around him, I, I, I mean, I think it comes down to Trippier and, and like Matoma versus a 4.5 and Sun. Yeah. And to me, I just, I don't think the difference in Sun and those other good midfielders is big enough mm -hmm. to justify losing Trippier. No, I get it. I get it. Definitely. He's been so impressive, hasn't he? Over. Again, a long period. I do like that longer lens as well when you look back to last season as well, which is what what generated this price as well. We've got a pretty 
extensive data set to consider now with him as well, right, Corey? So I think there's a lot of trust in there as well. Let's talk Gabriel. Arsenal, we know their fixtures are about to improve as well, and they start with this lovely home fixture against Sheffield United. Really intrigued with this pick, um, not from a team selection, but what sort of made you go Gabriel over over his his counterparts? Was it just money? Was there anything particularly that you've looked out there, Corey? Any, anything in him that we should be yeah, I'm, considering? I'm, I'm poor. Mm. <laughs> that's why mm -hmm. uh you know I, if i had actual team value i would uh i would go with a safer selection mm -hmm. i'm still worried long term uh on him mm -hmm. i so gabriel is one i think there's five players combined that have lost me a million dollars in team value and he's mm -hmm. one of them because i had him game week one and yeah. I, think I lost three. Oh yeah mm -hmm. you know um so obviously still worried but mm -hmm. he's the best attacking threat uh mm -hmm. other defenders yeah, except for maybe ben white but you know, obviously the price difference price, is, is yeah. huge there. And with their fixtures, I think um, you really, you really need, you need an Arsenal defender if you can at all afford it. So yeah. um, he fits in my price, my my budget. And, and so there he is. Yeah, it doesn't tend to get substituted. Does it? I mean, I'm here as a Zinchenko yeah. owner as well, who I like personally a little bit more as a player, but he doesn't have the minute too. security, right? In terms of the... The prospect of being uh, substituted tactically that feels more likely with Zinchenko over Gabriel, right? Yeah, yeah it not only substituted it off, which isn't yeah. quite as big. Deal. I mean, I think Zinchenko maybe last year, maybe once or twice, mm -hmm. got substituted before sixty. Mm. Um, but the sub on for Zinchenko is yeah. is when he does get rotated, he's probably going to come on. Yeah. So uh, Gabriel might, if they're you know ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw that when they went to the ten at what Palace. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it actually, I think he subbed on the first three weeks, right? Um, so anyway, yeah, for the beginning but, part of the season, yeah, he was coming back, and yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, mm -hmm. I but compared to Zinchenko, I mean, that's it's a bigger risk, right? Yeah. So uh, yeah, makes sense. I'm and again, I I don't really have a choice. No. So yeah, that's, another, yeah. that's where I get it. This midfield, Corey, I'm so intrigued, and I'm sure the guys watching will be too, because there, as as people know, there are so many options and so many different price points to consider. Before we come on to the the, the front two and and Archer that you've opted for, let's talk around this midfield. I just want to take it sort of player by player a little bit. The must haves, I'm assuming, would be Salah, right, in terms of a a wild card. Was there anyone else? Well, first of all, was that the case? Was there ever a wild card draft that you thought, do you know what? I'm maybe not going to go Mo Salah. I'm expecting that to be no. But were there any other must haves in your wild card midfield thoughts, Corey? Uh, Salah and Saka. Saka. Like uh, again, Arsenal's Arsenal's fixtures are really good, yeah. and I I think he gave up those two penalties against Bournemouth because he wasn't feeling. I think I think his his fitness was a problem. Um, but he's, he is the number one penalty taker. He might not always take them, mm -hmm. obviously, um, but he's also involved in so much of what they do and, and their, their fixtures are, are just so good that yeah. um, I like him so much better than Odegaard and Martinelli just has not been involved in the same way he was last year. So I, I, I think Saka for me was a no brainer. Yeah. And then Matoma also okay. with Brighton's or with Brighton's fixtures. Yeah. Um, I, I, I really wanted a Brighton attacker mm -hmm. and with, March was playing left, left back anyway, but now he's hurt. So Matoma was the one that mm -hmm. I was, I was focusing on. So those three were pretty, three pretty locked, pretty locked in. Uh, if, yeah. if, as they were healthy, I might consider him, but he's not. So there's no, no sense even considering okay. uh, talking about it. Yeah. Um, and then in Buemo's fixtures are just too poor. Too so, difficult. uh, yeah. those three were pretty much locked in on my draft, all my drafts. Really interesting. And and the, the Arsenal guys, I was going to, you sort of answered it preemptively, I guess, in terms of whether or not there were any thoughts to double up offensively with this great run. But you've sort of observed the problems. Odegaard, obviously not a cheap option anyway. And, you know, Trossard is, is, is not taking many minutes, right? It's been sporadic. But when he does, he seems to be uh, providing an attacking threat. So the Martinelli kind of quandary over minutes remains a consistent problem, right? Well, it's not. I mean, I think Martinelli's minutes are are fine. Mm -hmm. It's just he he's just not. Um, the structure of that team is different this mm -hmm. year, and and his his attacking threat is, is nowhere what it was last year. Mm -hmm. um, so I just don't see how you can justify taking him when you have so many other great options yeah. in midfield. 
yeah. um, that we hit. I mean, you, you don't have enough midfielders, right? So, so you can't really justify it, in my opinion. Uh, Saka is the only one. Um, yeah, you know, Odegaard is just again. He's also not. He's just. They're just not creating quite as much as they did last year, and it's kind of structurally different. You know, I think uh, I think the Rice mission has has kind of changed the the, the approach, and he they've also. Uh, you know, change the attacking patterns a, a bit, which has resulted in different players getting involved in, in different ways. So. Yeah, I hear you. And they highlighted that on Match of the Day as well, that kind of offensive struggles. And when, you know, they were just a little bit off it at Stanford Bridge, still yeah. scored two. But yeah, I find that interesting as well. So you'd mentioned Jared Bowen being kind of one of the ones who are not maybe quite so sure. And we've got this great fixture run. He seems in incredible goal scoring form and, and really talismanic for, for, for West Ham. What's kind of putting you off? Is that just a historic thing about West Ham not maybe being too offensive under Moyes? What's kind of the, the the slight doubt in your mind around including Jared Bowen, who I should say is in your team here, but what yeah. are your thoughts around him? Well, it's a difficult decision, right? So I, mm-hmm. it's just the opportunity cost of, of Bowen versus um, Diaby's the the one who's yeah. really the competition for him, mm-hmm. um, I think. And, and, you know, Villa is just... They look fantastic, especially at home. They look so they look so good. They do. Um, yeah, I'm happy to see because I thought I thought Emery kind of had a uh, a raw deal a bit at, at Arsenal. Um, he, you know, he wasn't great, but I think some of it was out of his control. Sure. And I think he's a pretty good pretty good manager. So um, for Bowen, there's two things that are a, I'm a little hesitant about. The first is just the the total volume of attacking. So yeah. I'm a big believer in not only underlying data so specifically xg but uh i'm also a big volume guy right mm-hmm. so i the thing about Ross is you have a lot of more opportunities for luck like today right he hits a sure. gets a deflected goal from 30 yards yeah. out mm-hmm. um so his volume a tight a, a touch low and then um ward prowse taking all the set pieces hurts his assist potential which he's had in the past mm-hmm. but uh i mean he's a great he's a he's a great player he's been great for them for Ever since he signed, really, um, and I had a great run with him two years ago when he uh, I got on him mm. early. He had that miraculous like ten week run. He was an incredible. Um, man. Yeah, mm. yeah. I think I picked him up the week the, the the first week he actually did anything. I think he got three assists. I can't even remember who they played. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm a big fan. I, it's one of those things when when a player has historically done well for you, you kind of gravitate towards to them. them. Or, yeah, of course you do. Yeah, of course you do. Also, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, that's why Watkins is in my team. But we'll talk about him in a second. Yeah. I've never, I've never done well with him, and he's always killed me when I don't have him. So, um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, no. So Bowen for me, it's a volume thing. But I do. I mean, their fixtures are really good. As yeah. you mentioned, he's really, really the, the 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 focus of their attack now that Antonio's aged a little bit, and they don't really have. God, a, he was a bad today. Line. Sorry to cut across you, but yeah. Antonio was dreadful today. It was, was. I mean, he's getting. Yeah. He all he's all he always had that in him, and now yeah. with the age think he's getting to a point where yeah. having him being a weekly starter is problematic. Yeah, so it's a, he's, and Bowen is playing as a second striker at times, right? So he's he's in the middle, he's in there. Um yeah, he's hungry. So, he's hungry yeah, he's, for goals, man. Definitely. Yeah, you know, there's been the rhetoric yeah. from from Moy sort of saying he's challenging him to be this talismanic figure and to be playing through mm-hmm. the middle a little bit more. And I think he stepped up, I think, with Rice leaving as well. Yeah. He's a, a new father as well. He's just signed a really long-term new contract as well. I think he's he sees his future at the club, which is great for West Ham fans. But for FBL managers as well, I think it bodes well with, with as I say, a, a really attractive run of run of fixtures from game week 10. Um, it's cheap. I mean, mm. what is he, 7-3? Seven, 7-3, three, three. yeah, wow. that's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's very affordable for, for what you're getting. Yeah. I do, I've got to ask you, though, about the, the Villa um, contingent in the team, right, Corey? So we've talked... We, Big them up, haven't we? Throughout this video, they were great today. Ollie Watkins will come on and talk about it in a minute. But I gotta say, I'm kind of surprised to just see the one Villa player in this team because they've got some value options, right? I mean, you've mentioned Diaby. Oh, yeah. Anyone else in the, in that in the mix there? That and I'm not going to pedal Douglas Louise anymore, but sort of Matty Cash or anyone like that come into your thoughts as well. Uh, so Cash is really expensive, mm. and. His numbers look great, right? Mm-hmm. If you just look at him raw, you're like, oh my God, this guy is an attacking force and a defender. Sure. But if you dig a little deeper, uh, the majority of his goal threat came early when he was essentially playing as a winger. Yeah. Um, and that now that they're healthy, 
er <laughs> at the wing, he's not doing that anymore. Um, and he's never been a creative force at all. His his attacking potential has always been goal scoring. So I just don't see him being worth the money. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but, you know, Paul and, and Kanza are there, and, yeah. and they're totally fine. So I, if for whatever reason, I would take Johnston. Uh, so if I were to go Johnston, mm-hmm. I would have probably end up with three Villa players because then I'd go to Diaby, yeah. and then I'd probably move Gehi to, uh, to a, a Villa defender. Yeah. Um, you did bring up Douglas Lees. I hadn't even looked at him. Yeah. Um, I'll give him a second thought. Uh, he is on penalties. He's on some set pieces, yeah. and he gets you know he's that late arriving uh, midfielder in the box a lot of times. So it's weird. Uh, I think volume. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, I think volume weird. from him is probably going to be a problem for me. But uh, so, I'm going to dig dig more into him and see if he's an option. I think what I would say about him as well, Corey, that longer lens we've talked about from last season. If you take his overall points for last season and then weight them against how he's performed so far this season, particularly the home form, the the, the I think then it's a compelling case, but it's the the amount of great midfielders you have. It's that it takes a spot, you know. So I think that's going to be exactly. the challenge that you're you're going to have, and that's certainly the challenge I had when I decided to to go with him. But I do think he's worth considering because of what he enables you to do elsewhere from a budget perspective. But Diaby, of course, Absolutely. I mean, him and Watkins looked terrific as a partnership today. So he would be the alternative, I guess, to Bowen if you were if you were to move. He would be the one that you think you, you would you would look there. Yeah, absolutely. And um, when I didn't have Trippier, mm-hmm. I my, that Gordon spot was Diaby, right? Yeah. So um, I think that is the the sacrifice mm-hmm. for for Trippier is, is is dropping that that fifth mid for me again because I'm completely broke. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, but Diaby is it's it's going to be a very tough decision. Sure. Um, they both have a great run of fixtures, but Villa's like stop after Bournemouth, I think, in five weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they completely changed. So I don't know that I want to have both of those Two guys. Attackers. And then, yeah. yeah, and then want to 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 move off of um, Watkins easily becomes Alvarez in 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 this scenario. But then you have Diaby. Who who do you want to do you want to have a second move? I don't know. So I'll look further. Uh, yeah, of course you will. And, and but it's it's it, Diaby is definitely very very good. Yeah, but it's still in the thoughts. Quick word for for. Anthony Gordon then um, in midfield as well. Corey's been sort of uh, much improved this season. Disciplinary issues seem to be uh, have been put to bed now and he's really determined and working hard to keep his place in a well-performing Newcastle team, right? Are you confident? Is he a, a looking like a pretty nailed option into your team, notwithstanding the options you just talked about? I mean, he, he, he seems like he's a great budget option. Yeah, he is. Um, I think as long as Barnes is hurt, I, it feels like he's got that position. Yeah. Um, you know, they might play Isak. They they could do other things. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Tough to leave him out, though, right? What's that? Tough. Yeah, it is. I mean, he's he's really good, and he yeah. fits what they do so well um, that I, I can't imagine him really losing a spot. And he, he, you know, he's he has enough threat, and it's such a good team that I, the value's there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then long-term, once Chelsea's fixtures swap, Palmer's just hanging out right there at 4.9, I know I'm penalty, so... I think that position, there are enough options long term that you can have that fifth mid- midfielder be cheaper, allowing you Salah and Holland and Trippier, and, and then still having a solid team elsewhere. Yeah. So I, I, I suspect I'll probably end up with that cheaper fifth mid mm-hmm. for a while at least. I like that. That's a cool tactic as well. You've got the players that you've mentioned. We talked Douglas Luiz. I think you mentioned Neto as well. You talked about Cole Palmer. There's like we said throughout the whole video there's there's a lot of great midfield options yeah. let's look forward to the forwards then Corey Harland we don't need to talk about Erling Harland I'm sure you know being in the wildcard team is straightforward Watkins kind of talked around him and and the battles you've had historically let's talk about some of the other options as well that I'm sure are going through your yeah. mind I mean is there any sort of case to be made for a Newcastle forward or maybe say a Darwin Nunes or Alvarez what kind of thoughts around forwards from a game week 10 wild card are, are going through your head right now yeah I mean if you could get uh nailed on Liverpool or Newcastle forward you'd absolutely 100% have them but mm-hmm. that doesn't seem to be something that's going to happen Wilson is just too good to not play and Isak is too good to not play. So unless one of them is hurt for a long period, I can't imagine them not rotating. Uh, Liverpool, uh, you know, Klopp has – Darwin has some issues, right? He's um, 
from a pressing perspective, he's getting better, but he's still, he's never going to be, I don't think, at least for now, he's never going to be a nailed on, uh, a, a nailed on position unless people get hurt because there are too many options with Gakpo and Jada in there. And then, you know, Salah ever present and Diaz there as well. Um, so given the price point, it just, I, I just don't really see anyone competing with Watkins who plays every minute yeah. in a, a great attacking team. And that has great fixtures. Mm-hmm. Alvarez is the one, but they, their fixtures go terribly. Yeah. They really um, sour, don't they? Really, really bad. And um, I do think long-term he still has rotation issues. I've been saying this all year and he hasn't been rotated yet. Um, but I do think, at some point, once they get a little healthier, there is going to start being some rotation issues mm-hmm. with him. Mm-hmm. Presuming like Grealish starts playing well again and and what have you, but um, I, I certainly I would be really shocked if I don't have Alvarez once the fixtures turn. Um, obviously, I have to deal with the eighteen blank for them, but uh, he's going to be on my team at some point. Yeah. But given the fixture, I just don't see any justification for taking him over Watkins. No, I get um, it. Yeah, he's still great yeah. value, isn't he? As and when you pick him back up, you'll be it'll be pretty straightforward to do with that that price point that he's got. And the point you make about Darwin Nunes, I'm sitting here as a Darwin Nunes owner, Corey, as well. And it's that, isn't it? It's that concern over the minutes, which is so frustrating ahead of what is a great run for Liverpool. But you just don't know if he's going to see enough of the minutes to to yeah. make good on that pick. And on a wild card, yeah. I guess that makes it an, an impossibility to to select, right? Yeah, and the other the other option if you could ever get a sense of someone being nailed is whoever starts for arsenal whether mm-hmm. it's in Ketty or, or jesus um they are both cheap and they are involved enough that they would be viable options but mm-hmm. again there's just so much rotation with those two and Havertz sometimes playing up there mm-hmm. that um i just i mean it, it seems like holland and watkins um is the way to go yeah um or exactly. salvarez keeps so maybe, maybe, maybe I continuously be wrong on that, but yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I never really had any kind of thought to anything else. Um, the and then obviously Archer, Archer's there as the, the yeah, chief enabler. Make, right. Yeah. And he looked okay. Right. And the game that I just played over the weekend, he's yeah. done okay as a, if he ever had to sub on, you wouldn't be horrified by sure. the prospect he's playing as a, yeah, definitely. Um, and look, fancyfootballfix.com's fixture projections defensively for Palace I think are top of the tree certainly for the next four game weeks and not look beyond that but they're still projecting them to be uh, good defensively despite the, the heavy defeat um, you know away at Newcastle which is a super tough game Corey let's say that it's game week 10 starting tomorrow is this the team and squad you're rocking with or do you think there's a there's a chance that things might change what what, what do you think is most likely to be the the squad and team yeah I, for tomorrow for, if i think tomorrow. this is probably it. Mm-hmm. yeah I, I think this is it um i think i have 0.2 in the bank okay. in this team mm-hmm. maybe 0.1 um so not a lot of flexibility no. and i i don't I don't foresee me changing much. Um, it, presuming no injuries, I think this would be the team I'd start with. Um, I think the captaincy would be, as yeah. you've stated here, with Salah the captain and, and Watkins the vice. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I've – or maybe Saka the vice. We'll, we'll see. Yeah, um, yeah. But I'd be pretty happy with this lineup, I think, in those fixtures Definitely. heading in the next week. Lots of lovely home fixtures in there. Definitely. Final word before we wrap things up, Corey. We've gone from three Spurs to no Spurs, but of course you're going to wish wish them well. I'm I'm sure ahead of their their game week nine fixture, which is yet to be played. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, they're they're a great team. Uh, it's, it's all about fixtures and price there. Uh, obviously, if I could afford Sun, I would, yeah. but I can't. And I just I I. I don't think the sacrifice of Trippier in the back is worth the the, the upgrade of Sun over a Bowen yeah. in, in the midfield. And that's really what it comes down to. And what about getting to Madison? If you could get to Ma- – I take about Sun a bit more difficult, but does James Madison over Bowen if you could get there without too much surgery, which I'm not looking at the team and struggling to see how that would be achieved. But do you think there's much in it between James Madison and, and Jared Bowen, a straight-up decision between the two of them with the upcoming fixtures? I think if the fixtures were even, um, I would try that, but they're not, Definitely. right? So Bowen, uh, Bowen and West Ham have some great, great games coming up, and, and the Spurs have some, some challenges. So I, uh, I'm sure Madison will be my team again. I'm sure Poro or Doggy will, and probably Son at some point. But 
um, not in the near term. Okay, look, let's wrap it up there, Corey, because that's ending on a positive West Ham story. So I've su- successfully managed to steer the narrative off a 4-1 defeat uh, to West Ham to a positive conclusion. So, you know, good on me. Thanks ever so much for coming on the channel, man. Anything else you wanted to say before we wrap things up? Uh, no, it was great to talk to you. It's been a while and, uh, you know, hope your hammers uh, <laughs> continue on, at least with their European success, yeah, right? Let's hope that Jared Bowen keeps doing his thing. All right, Corey, great to have you back on and I'm sure we'll talk to you again in a few game weeks time and find out how this wild card has played out. Guys, do please get down into the comments and let Corey know what you think of his wild card selections ahead of game week 10. Do please smash a like on the video on your way out and do please head over to fantasyfootballfix.com and subscribe and be sure to set your push notifications on if you want to follow along to our elite managers. But without further ado, guys, let's wrap things up ahead of game week 10 and I'll see you all next week. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.